So before you joined uh, Russ, I was telling Frederica that uh, the last two sections, so the heading level twos, uh, where we get into API calls and then into Node.js, those topics I did not, uh, I didn't have a moment to finish, uh, but the content that I have for today is going to be well within covering our hours time. Um, there's a lot of detail here, and I was expressing to Frederica that JavaScript as a language as a core element of web development in general is almost like we've got to pause and really take into consideration how HTML has evolved from, you know, web 1.0 to 2.0 and now, you know, the future of this 3.0 concept that everyone's talking about, this blockchain scenario. If we look at the various HTML uh, uh, developments, right, H HTML 1.0 to currently HTML5, all of the various points there, ECMAScript or JavaScript, its development in, in security and, and how it interacts and, and, and all of the web APIs that, that are just a plethora of so much information. And at the core of all of this, there's three elements that come together and it's HTML, JavaScript, and, and CSS. Now these can be delineated into their subcategories of vast amounts of information, uh, but we really want to just take and consider what exactly this JavaScript interactivity piece is. And especially within the context of our shiny objective or, or this engineering shiny grade book, how can we leverage outside of our studio? How can we leverage outside of, of, of the current shiny uh, framework and be able to plug in other elements to, to make our, our services even more efficient? And that's really the core of this chapter is, is we're scratching the surfaces of, of the beginning of that next book, that JavaScript with our book. Um, I wrote some learning objectives here uh, related to the topics covered in the, the, the book itself. The first learning objective I have is interacting with shiny apps using JavaScript. And I put the, the little rocket ship because this will blast you into the ether. Um, it will blast you into a completely different uh, uh, thought process of what you can do with your app, what you can do with your shiny server, what you can do with your UI. Um, JavaScript opens up an entire new plethora of environment that you can you can increase uh, capabilities, uh, make your make your uh, job, uh, your shiny app even even more um, user friendly. Um, the second learning statement here is uh, ma manipulating the UI and the server linkages. Um, we will find that there's a point in this document where it talks about uh, JavaScript for R and then R for JavaScript. And what uh, Mr. Colin Fay was doing uh, with relation is showing you the UI side, browser side of JavaScript versus the server side of JavaScript. And that's where the last two sections come in is it's more server oriented. The third objective is learning the various methods to apply JavaScript to your Shiny app. Um, we've got uh, uh, actually three different ways that you can include a JavaScript function or, or a script into your um, a deployment of your Shiny app when you, when you actually render run server um, or run your Shiny app. The fourth option is, uh, our fourth list is understanding how to reference elements in an HTML document using JavaScript. Um, this is probably the, the largest, I would say, needed section or needed important piece to this topic. Um, being able to drop into your dev tools and interacting with your document object model from a JavaScript or a jQuery syntax allows you to do more with testing, do more with, with uh, uh, interacting, interacting with the server, calling on details, et cetera. And then the fifth one is uh, comprehend the differences between JavaScript and jQuery. Um, I may change that last one. I'm not sure that's actually accurate. Uh, jQuery is a subset of JavaScript. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit more lightweight. Um, last week, Russ, when you were giving your presentation, uh, there were some references to SQLite. Uh, and, and so just imagine that it's a, a very light footprint database. Uh, that's kind of the differences between JavaScript and jQuery. Um, one comment I'll make in this final thought before I move to the next slide. jQuery is really built in a manner to be agnostic to the browser. And this is an important factor because there are various libraries within ECMA uh, that certain browsers don't recognize. And the most famous 
uh, point to that is Microsoft Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge. They seem to be the odd ducks within the family of our various browser choices. Um, there, there's a lot of discussion as developers to take that into consideration when you're making certain um, functional calls uh, or, or script calls. Moving on. I should ask, this is large enough for everybody to see, correct? Uh, I got rid of our table of contents and just focusing on the, the actual slide itself. This is a really, really huge chapter. And it's not from a length standpoint, there's larger chapters in our current book uh, that we've covered in the past. I say the word huge because it's just a large subject. There are so many facets to the world of, of web development and to JavaScript, um, even within the various frameworks of authoring JavaScript. Uh, I continually get wrapped around the axle sometimes when you're looking at <clears throat> Ember as a, as a service, that's a Facebook oriented JavaScript library. Uh, or Angular. Angular is more Google oriented and Angular kind of goes into where the Go language comes in. Um, there's different flavors of JavaScript. Uh, and so in that case, the topic is often very complicated because you want to make sure that you're calling on the right uh, framework in, in authoring your subject matter. A different way that we can approach that same thought process would be the development of using BASAR versus using Tidyverse. Right. The, uh, the use of the pipe within our script, uh, that in its own right gives you uh, different uh, syntactical manners in which you're, you're calling on libraries. Okay. Uh, JavaScript is maintained by the European Computer Manufacturing Association, or ECMA. Um, oftentimes, you will also hear the term JavaScript being uh, referred to as ECMA script. Um, those are synonymous with each other. They mean the same thing. There is different versions within the ECMA library. So there's a 2015 version, there's a 2016 version. Um, and again, similar concepts here would be like in Python, where you have your different Python uh, uh, frameworks of you know, version two versus version three. Usually they don't course, correlate with each other. Okay. All right, continuing on, where do I use JavaScript? What, <laughs> where do I find JavaScript? How do I interact with JavaScript? Well, it's, it's, it's actually everywhere. Uh, pretty much in any uh, browser or any website, any current utility that you use, it's got some JavaScript baked in somewhere. Okay. Examples that I included uh, for uh, reference here is interactive web pages. And I used uh, like radio buttons, text entry, dynamic changing of, of CSS attributes, et cetera, um, hiding and, and uh, removing uh, uh, variables, et cetera. The second, I'm very focused on e-learning uh, or, or learning management systems, learning record stores. And we utilize JavaScript heavily within the handshake between our server and browser. Sorry, yeah, server and browser. On Monday, Frederica and I were in the ggplot uh, topic and Lydia, one of our cohort members was giving a presentation of visual ggplot output. At the conclusion of her presentation, we opened up the topic on uh, data visualization. And so I, I started to explain the D3JS uh, library. Uh, Frederica took uh, quite, quite a uh, interest in it. So uh, we've got some side conversations covering that topic as well. And then finally, uh, you're using it uh, right now at this moment as I uh, knitted the uh, RStudio RMD file into our web presentation. It has JavaScript interaction. Um, if I, I don't know if I can do this. Well, now I'm looking for my little arrow to pop up. It may be because I'm zoomed in so close, but um, that, the little arrow, if you were to click on that as a mouse listener and it advances to the next slide, that is JavaScript. Okay. All right, JavaScript is one of the primary standards within the Worldwide Consortium or the WC3, uh, W3C. WC3, Worldwide Consortium. Let me make sure that I spelled that correctly. Um, I, it should be copy and paste, so I think it is W3C. Uh, the Worldwide Consortium is similar to the ECMA uh, found a, uh, community. Uh, it's a, it's a, a group of, of industry leaders that are managing the protocols that we have for the World Wide Web interaction. Um, there is a very, very, very stark contrast difference between what we do in a W3 concept, World Wide Web concept, versus the internet itself. 
Um, so what I want to separate the two is here I'm using it as a presentation media uh, where I'm interacting with elements of browser to server exchange. Whereas if we talk about the internet as a service, that's where you get into a lot of your networking protocols and, and uh, TCP IP, UDP, et cetera. So there is a difference between the two. Um, if your school's a thought, you wanna make sure that you're heading down the right uh, direction on, on subject matter. Okay. Other standards within the W3C uh, include the HTML language or hypertext markup language, cascading style sheets or CSS, um, as an extension, I did not include it in the bullet statement, but um, the newest and the latest and greatest is like SAS, um, which I can't remember. It's, I, I don't remember what the acronym for SAS is or SCSS uh, is another one. Um, the standard vectors graphic library, um, that's where we get into our data visualization or, or uh, vector graphics or, or a way that we can uh, present media in a graphical or uh, uh, using your GPU versus your, your uh, uh, CPU instead. Um, polygons, standard vectors graphic is polygons. Uh, and then jQuery as a language. And again, it's a derivative of JavaScript. So I don't want it to um, take front stage here. Uh, it is a subset of the JavaScript language. And then finally, uh, AJAX. And I've always been curious what the acronym AJAX stood for. Uh, so this was an opportunity for me to list it. It's asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, I found that a lot of early Microsoft Internet Explorer websites uh, were written with AJAX. Um, if you ever notice um, at the end of your web URL, uh, you can always tell what library is being used to interact between browser and server. Uh, and so at the very end, uh, sometimes you would see the, the dot Ajax at the end. This will, this may all appear confusing. <laughs> all of these topics we're covering may appear confused, uh, confusing only with the relation that our whole book club to date has been discussing our studio. And here it is now we're, we're bridging away from that and discussing other details that um, are really at the very core of, of everything that we do. We just don't really give it focus. Um, or as I say, and most R developers who deploy Shiny apps may not even leave the R Studio environment. And that's perfectly acceptable. There's no reason why you have to branch out outside of R Studio because the R Studio and Shiny server handshake uh, allows us this built framework to present our data visualization or our data, in data interaction. Okay. Uh, one could claim the primary reason for adding additional JavaScript is to make it hyper-performance to your web app. Now, this is objective, so I'm not saying that everyone is going to, you know, nitro charge your, your web app using JavaScript. I'm saying that it opens up a wider array of access or a wider array of libraries to do more with your, your web app, okay? And I put a note here, uh, when I start to uh, delineate between being a shiny app uh, within the boundaries of our shiny server uh, or our shiny, shiny uh, package, and then I'm gonna start calling it a web app instead. And the reason I'm making that delineation is because it isn't just shiny anymore. It's not just using the shiny language anymore. Now we're adding other elements that are, would be outside of our studio. Okay. Um, the next statement is, but what is it doing under the hood? What exactly is JavaScript doing under the hood? Well, all of shiny, when we uh, start our UI and our server uh, or, or app and UI, it's binding these UI elements using JavaScript to interact with R. Okay, so let's talk about this briefly because I did want to add a mermaid image or a, or a uh, oh, what's the R package for, for generating uh, vector images. I wanted to show what exactly is going on with this binding concept. R as a software package, or, or I'll even call it a kernel. Uh, it is a runtime environment within our server. And now we're using web calls, uh, web socket calls from our browser to interact with that R kernel. JavaScript is the language that allows us to make those calls back and forth. Okay. R talks to your browser through web sockets. Communication happens in both directions. So we have mouse, or sorry, we have listeners and we have uh, uh, calls that are being sent from the browser back to the server as an expectation. Now we, we in the past, we always talk about reactivity. Uh, Shiny has a lot of 
references to reactive calls. That's ultimately what I'm referring to in this WebSocket handshake is these listener and events that are being sent back and forth between these two uh, services. That WebSocket is the, or JavaScript is the language that allows us to make that interaction. Okay. Any questions so far? Any details so far? No, okay. Um, actually, uh, on my screen, I can, I can at the bottom element here, you can see that I have some two HTML widgets. Uh, these are the arrows going forward and back. Uh, the little hand pointer, uh, the little gloved hand, that is both a CSS element, but um, when I click the mouse, when I actually select that uh, element or that attribute on the web page and advance to the next screen, it's using JavaScript to make that happen. Okay. It may be using jQuery, but either way, it's JavaScript in its, in its nature. Okay. All right, so let's cover just a brief introduction to JavaScript as a, as a service. The fastest way to interact with JavaScript is to drop into your development tools of your favorite browser, Rust. During your presentation, you were talking about Lighthouse. Um, Lighthouse is a Google um, uh, recording service, uh, optimizing testing service. And when we dump into dev tools, you can start seeing the elements of your web page. Uh, you're, you're, you're kind of opening the hood and looking at the engine itself. Okay. Uh, for example, entering, uh, sorry, for example, enter the following in your dev tools console. Uh, if you do var message equals hello world, and then as a re response, alert message. Um, I'm gonna do this real quick. So uh, let me see if I can pull up my browser real quick. And I'm just gonna uh, do an F12, which is a shortcut for our dev tools. Um, you, you all are seeing my, my dev panel. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So taking that, uh, uh, sorry, copy and paste that real quick. Give me. So we're creating a variable called message. We're passing the uh, uh, values of hello world to that message. Then we create an alert event, which populates the message. <laughs> Excuse me. So let's go back to our browser and dump that into our console. Let me move this up. Okay, so this is our active console and you can see that from our DevTools console window. All right. When I paste that call in, right, this has nothing to do with the server or, or uh, at the time I've got the tab open for our, our book. That has nothing to do with that particular handshake. This is only within your single user's browser. It has nothing to do with any web calls. So by accessing JavaScript, running this variable message, populating hello world, and then creating an alert message, this is what happens. So I'm gonna execute that by entering the enter key. At the top, you will notice it says engineering shiny org says, hello world. Well, the reason it's populating that engineering shiny.org is that's the uh, parent URL or the, the current uh, environment that my document object model is interacting with. If I were to do this from any other browser and run that same code, it would populate back and say, within this document object model, I'm replying back and says, hello world. Okay. All right, let's pause there, go back to our presentation. Um, throughout this upcoming uh, section of our, our discussion, uh, we're gonna be making some references to some uh, various jQuery and JavaScript uh, libraries until the server's active running. Uh, most of them probably won't work. So there are three primary ways to include JavaScript in your uh, current Shiny app. Uh, a first example would be using an external file. Okay. So um, you would have a particular file ending in the JS extension. <clears throat> it would be included in some kind of a parent script folder, which would be a child of the, the actual w, uh, World Wide Web dub, 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 uh, folder of a web server. When your browser is building or compiling to its presentation, it's rendering HTML, it's looking at the CSS, and then it's accessing these, these JavaScript libraries. Right? They're textual files that are part of the handshake with your, your server client exchange. Okay. Um, you can also include them as a script call within a, a uh, HTML file. Um, I'll show you this here in a second. 
Russ and Frederick, I'm going to jump over, back over to our <clears throat> book club and uh, indicate where these are being used. And then finally, if we were to make direct JavaScript calls in line with our, our uh, uh, HTML document, um, I see this every so every once in a while, but for the most part, um, this has kind of been not deprecated. It's just not a good way of really building web apps. Um, you don't want to make a inline call because it's very static and it's difficult to maintain. Um, what you want to do is create a separate uh, textual file that you include as a script reference, and then you can just manage that instead. Okay. So let's jump back over to our web page real quick, and I'll show you these attributes. I still have DevTools open. Um, to view this, we're going to select our Sources menu. Within the Sources menu, let's drop this down a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, where did I find that at? Let's go to Engineering Shiny Org. All right. Um, so we have these three libraries, CSS, Images, and Libs. Uh, our, our actual text document, what I'm rendering, uh, if I were to close this real quick, what I'm rendering here would be the HTML file itself. Contained in the HTML is all these references to build and construct uh, this uh, uh, shiny engineering shiny grade book club uh, or document. Okay. Back to F12. All right. Inside libs, you can see that I've got some jQuery folders. There's some bootstraps and, and uh, other elements as well, but let's just expand the jQuery real quick. We can see that I've got a jQuery 360 minimum JS. You will find, uh, uh, expanding on the topic, I need to reinforce this for our presentation, but um, there are these JavaScript libraries, frameworks that are available and we can include them, plug them into our uh, Shiny apps. As an example, this particular web server, engineeringshiny.org uh, URL, it's using this jQuery minimum JS. Well, let's go ahead and open that real quick and see what it looks like. Okay, expand this over. And I don't think I can actually get rid of that call. Um, but we can see that we're calling on a jQuery, uh, creating a function ENT uh, using strictly uh, strict uh, object equals uh, type of modules, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, and this will run for quite some time. Uh, what you will find, and I think Russ, you and I were conversing over it, in a uh, previous discussion, the whole beautifying or, or uh, minifying JavaScript um, when you are optimizing server uh, uh, production grade web apps, uh, usually you'll try and, and make them as small as possible so that it, you have the fastest network call um, as the uh, user is, is generating or, or rendering your, your web page. Sometimes these will get really big. They'll be thousands of lines long and they'll be all crunched together and really ugly to look at. Uh, you can, you can unminify them or you can beautify them and, and pull them back out into their structure. I wouldn't recommend doing it within the document object model. I would use a text editor for that instead. Okay. All right. Now, if we look at our, our actual web page, though, this is the HTML page. What I wanted to show you is there is a hierarchical structure to HTML. You will always have an HTML tag, right? Or I guess we will we'll start with the word preamble. Within an HTML document, you will always have a preamble. The preamble allows us to uh, uh, create this environment that is our, our compiler, the document object model, model compiler. The first thing that happens is an HTML tag. That's the uh, parent structure. We're gonna talk about the tree effect and the root directory, et cetera, uh, or root uh, structure of an HTML doc. But HTML is the container. Inside there, you're gonna have head, body, script, uh, maybe some CSS calls, et cetera. Let me scroll down here. Here's the script call that I was wanting to reference. All right, so we can see just this highlighted line at line 24, I've got a HTML tag. It's a script tag that is pointing at a source file called libs bootstrap bootstrap bundle min JS. Let's go look at it. If I open up bootstrap and I look at bootstrap bundle min JS, that's our reference. And if I can select that, I can see what that function looks like. 
well, I'm not hacking anything here. So just be clear, I'm not doing anything that's that's outside the norm of the, uh, the uh, World Wide Web's uh, uh, framework. What I'm doing is dumping in or opening up the hood and actually looking at the elements inside the structure of this Engineering Shiny Org website. All right, let's go back to presentation. No, that, that, that one's right here. There we go. Uh, the reference I was making to this external file, that's how they're, they're managing their JavaScript library. Um, if you make a direct script call, you can embed uh, a functional uh, arithmetic or, or logical operation within that, that particular tag. And you would use the script tag to do that with. Then finally, the, the inline with the specific tag. Okay, the recommended practice for all of this is always doing it in an external uh, file structure. If you're develop, uh, deploying using Golem as a package manager, that's a, a really big component of this whole book. There's two ways that we can access that. Actually, there's three, but I don't know why they didn't add the word three, uh, three in the line. Um, the first one is using a Golem add JS file. What that does is automatically create a container where you put your JavaScript into. Um, it's, a, it's, it's going back to that external file management concept. Uh, you can just add a direct handler and in this case, it would it would be uh, intended to work with our uh, you're you're creating an environment or a or a linkage between the user interface and the and the server itself. And then finally, this third is a is a JS binding. Um, the comment says it's for advanced users, custom interaction for shiny apps. So referencing these three bullets to what I had previously just shown you, I believe the JS file is that external file concept. If we're using this JS handler, that's more of like a, a direct script uh, entry into the HTML document. And then finally, if we use JS binding, um, that's going to be uh, inside a particular line of text or, or inside a, uh, a tag itself. Undering HTML, sorry, understanding HTML class and IDs. I touched on this topic briefly, but let's let's cover this. Within, uh, think of a web page as a tree uh, or a, or this branching type concept, right? All of these different various tags. Hypertext markup language is a derivative of the uh, SGML. And I can't remember what the S stands for. I wanna say simple, but I don't think that's right. It's a, it's a uh, initial uh, structure for managing um, a Darwin architecture. Darwin meaning that everybody has some family association to it. When we talk SGML into XML, uh, sorry, SGML into HTML or uh, SGML into Markdown uh, or SGML into uh, XML formatting, all of these are different tagging Darwin architecture frameworks that create a family child uh, association, parent child association. This particular uh, browser or, or, or if we get into a web language syntax, it's called the document object model, your DOM. When you reference the DOM, it can be of any form, right? You've got different vendors of, of, uh, of uh, browsers. If that's Apple Safari, if that's Mozilla Firefox, if that's Google Chrome, um, DuckDuckGo, Internet Explorer, Edge, right? These are all just different families of browser. At their core, you can all consider them document object models. They're a compiler. You can work with any of these HTML nodes or tags with any JavaScript element. So we're going to talk about class and ID here in a second. Right. The following code snippet uh, is a comparison between R, what we would generate in R using a Shiny app, uh, versus the HTML rendered output. Monday, Frederica, you and I were discussing the data visualization, SG, uh, uh, sorry, uh, standard vectors, graphic, D3JS, et cetera. And I kept repeating myself by saying that you're interacting with tags, you're interacting with uh, the elements of that SVG. That's really what D3JS does. What we're doing here, what I was referencing, are these different tags in the front of an HTML document or tags within a, a standard vectors graphic SVG file. These tags are one way in which you can access JavaScript. So you can call on those particular tags. If we want to call on a class, right, a class is going to be a special characteristic of that tag, right? In this case, it's, it's a container uh, fluid row, or sorry, fluid. 
we have our H2 tag, which is a heading level two tag. Um, that is a element or a tag within the HTML file. Uh, it happens to contain the text, hello shiny. And then finally, we've got a couple of other ad additional features here. Uh, we created uh, through our text input, a action and input call. Okay. We have a label, its class is control label, and it's uh, uh, four, 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 what's the four? Four equals. Um, its label is, is uh, sorry, it's not function. Russ, what's the term I'm trying to use here? I wanna create that WebSocket linkage between the UI and the, and the server. Um, that is our, uh, I don't wanna use the word element either. It's, it's what we're watching for. Uh, we're creating this, this uh, opening uh, point of action and we're labeling it input. Then we have an input ID of action uh, with a type text. That's the expected input that we would receive from it. And then it's gonna be of class form control, value is null or, or empty, nothing. So again, this is a comparison between what we would see in our studio, our, our, our script file versus what is going to be generated on the output side. I guess my final comment, Frederica, where I'm trying to, to finish this topic is uh, we use Pandoc quite often to transpose or protocol translate uh, from one language to another language. Um, Pandoc allows us that bridge between those services. Uh, Knit R, is another way that we can do that. Um, there's a, I won't get into it. I'll just keep moving. Anyway, in, in one structure, we're seeing it in our studio code after it is rendered an output, this is what the HTML document would look like. These correlate with each other. They're identical with each other. Yeah, uh, sorry, Ryan. Uh, I see that uh, they're quite different. So if you think that they mean the same thing, they do the same thing. Um, they, they do the identical, yes. They, so, so in the RStudio world of, of our R script file, what we have on the top level example, as it is uh, when you go to run your Shiny app, what you will get on the output side, let me see if I can, sorry, real quick. Uh, this does something funny when I do it. Uh, let's inspect element. I think that's how it works. So I'm going to open up a different window if I can show the team. My markup language of this knitted presentation is in one window. Um, within that context, it automatically creates another window for your dev tools, our dev tools. What I'm, what I'm referencing or what I'm calling here in this example is I have the our markdown file within our studio, right? That's one language. And we have different <clears throat> tagging elements of hashtags and, you know, tick marks of, you know, code blocks, et cetera. When I go to knit that together and it starts the web server, this web page of my presentation, what I'm doing is now accessing the internal workings of the server versus the browser itself. Does that make sense? Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really truly recommend doing this, not because I don't want you to, it's, uh, it looks different. It acts different. Um, I like the dev tools in Chrome, the dev tools in, in uh, Mozilla Firefox. Um, although we are accessing the same dev tools in this R document object model, um, it's a little, it looks a little bit funny. It acts a little bit funny. I can still render the same console or I can still look at the same sources um, of our particular server. So I was messing around with this uh, yes, uh, last night because I was trying to make a, a reference to what this particular function call is doing. Uh, this is quite extensive. Um, let me see if I can show you an example where I'm at. So this is our inert polyfill minimum JS. There's a call to the, our shiny environment that generated this particular or uses this, this uh, JavaScript file. Um, over on the side is where I was Event listeners. So we're going to talk about event listeners here in just a second in our presentation, but this long list in our browser, if I were to expand one, let's just say a mouse click, or mouse over, right? 
what I'm making a reference to is this R Studio uh, uh, textual call. Um, this is in line 13104 of this particular file. And if I select this link, uh, what it'll do is it will open up and show that particular call. But if you're looking at this, it doesn't, it doesn't look familiar. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wanting to make an association here, but I, I'm a little bit unfamiliar with it. So I wanted to make this grand scheme call of, hey, look what this is doing. But I looked at this and I was like, it, it made my head hurt trying to figure out um, how these two uh, points were, were coming together with each other. So I'm just gonna leave that as is and let's go back to the presentation. Um, oh yeah, pause debugger. So basically, this is what the the library the shiny so shiny does the uh, the surface things so the things that we see and the HTML is what happened under the hood so underneath the surface is uh, uh, Pandoc intervene uh, translating to uh, the shiny language our shiny would, language to HTML or something like that. Mm -hmm. I would say it this way. The HTML gives the document object model instructions to render uh, or to associate tags uh, to our uh, presentation. The references I'm making are to both JavaScript and to cascading style sheets, CSS. Um, those references, those points outside of the, the HTML document, they're accessing other libraries to pull in or to... Uh, to uh, uh, build, compile the presentation media itself. So the the big the big the the, the big part is Pandoc, basically. So the one when we go who... when we transpose from an R Studio language into a a HTML JavaScript CSS language, it's using Pandoc as an engine to take that text render it and then output a different file structure or a different uh, naming structure, textual structure. Uh, in this case, it would be that HTML file. So in case of any issues, maybe it's uh, because of Pandoc that hasn't made the right conclusion basically or something like that. Exactly, yes. If you have an uh, incorrect version of Pandoc, um, you will have an ex uh, unexpected output or, or even errors in generating. Um, that was actually where that, uh, that particular difficulty came in uh, with the, uh, when you were trying to knit or output your, your markdown file and it was giving you a, a uh, error. Um, that was actually due to the fact that it didn't know how to manage those tags. It didn't know how to generate read in input and then output text. So I'll keep going. Sorry. It, it, this is a very, very critical thought process to maintain in understanding the actual lineage of how your R Studio script now becomes this uh, UI server output versus accessing it with JavaScript. Um, it's all very much uh, part and partial to the same, same conversation. What we did here is we created the div tag. Div tag is just a container uh, with that boost bootstrap container. We created an H2 tag and then we had uh, in, uh, an input field and ID and class or that, that were designated as an ID and class. Um, IDs are unique where class is more global. So if you're, if you're dealing with uh, cascading style sheets, if you're dealing with your um, ID elements or, or any sort of searchable calls, et cetera, those ID elements are, are a numeric value uh, that allows the web sockets to exchange data back and forth. I don't say they're arbitrary value, it is generated, but it's during the runtime that those are generated. Um, we don't actually call those ID numbers. We can statically tell it what we wanna use as an ID, but there's a note here that says all IDs must be unique. Um, think of it as the same concepts of a referential database. Your keys within the table must be unique. Um, if you had two keys, which one are we calling on? Um, so I, I would avoid, well, I shouldn't say that. I would recommend a tendency to avoid statically naming ID values. 
Um, it's from a learning perspective or from an early stage of development, it's probably a good idea uh, to gain some recognition of what's going on. Uh, but then as you start to become a little bit better as a developer, let the system assign ID values by themselves. All right. Elements can have a class which can apply to multiple elements. Uh, this can be used in JavaScript, but it is also very useful for uh, styling elements in CSS. Um, the next chapter uh, in this book, if I'm not mistaken, is Cascading Style Sheet. So we're making JavaScript references early, and then we're going to move over to the look and feel of the, the presentation media, Cascading Style Sheets, um, both of which are referencing these class and ID numbers or values. Um, Russ or Frederica, do you have any other details or topics before I start this next section at all? I hope I'm not being well. No, no. Confused. I was just uh, I I found it interesting that you were uh, recommending that we um, automate the production of ID values when basically oh, uh, th throughout Shiny uh, you're you're typically um, defining them. You're kind of hard coding them, but admittedly for what will end up being a minority of the elements in the resulting HTML. But yeah, uh, it, it, I just thought it was interesting. But well, uh, the, yeah, no, I've got no further. No, my, 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 my comment towards allowing the system to generate uh, ID tags is primarily when we are uh, compiling the server or, or actually doing the run app concept, there are automatic tags that are put in memory allocating the human naming convention. That's something different. What I'm saying is you don't want to statically name that. Um, there is a limit to the human brain that we can iterate over billions and billions of numbers uh, or hex values, hash values. But the point is the computer is much more efficient at generating those, I guess is my reference. Yeah. This next section uh, does a comparison between JavaScript uh, calls versus uh, jQuery, uh, sorry, yeah, vanilla JavaScript calls. Uh, it's just a quick example. Um, I wasn't able to get this to render or I was, I, 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 I was having some difficulty with generating a shiny app and then actually showing uh, user interaction or the document object model, dev tools interaction. Um, this is a text directed from the document or, or block from the document. What we did is say, here's our, our element. This is what we created. This div ID is first, the number of, sorry, the name is number and the class is wide DV. These are just arbitrary names associated with these, these uh, uh, placeholders. If we were to use a JavaScript, vanilla JavaScript uh, interaction with this element, we would say document query selector, and then we pass it first. We're looking for a textual list called first. So that's where we're calling on the ID. Uh, document dot get element ID or by ID is going to be assigned. I, th I think this is a like a wildcard type search, anything that has first in it. Whereas the get element by ID, we are telling it what to search for. Return anything that has the 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 ID or the text first in it. Right. Um, we can also call on the class or query the class. So that's going to be document .query select all or select or all. And in this case, uh, we're looking for the dot y div as a class. Uh, document get element by class name, and then this is just the textual naming convention assigned to it. Uh, so in one instance. Um, we're looking through all of our texts for the uh, term class-wide div, returning it. Here, we're looking for the naming convention or what we've assigned it, uh, wide div. The third option is with the name attribute, uh, get element by name, and that's looking for number. So again, that's the reference name up here. We're searching through all of the, the variables name uh, for the value number. And then finally, the tag. This is where I was re referencing the HTML tagging process, this Darwin architecture process, um, if we wanted to pull in all the, the div tags. And I, I, I can guarantee, let's just try this real quick. 
Yeah, I'll just even pull that over. I'm gonna see what the output looks like. I did not try this before our presentation. So this is live, live changes here. Um, I'm gonna open our console real quick and I'm gonna paste in that document dot get elements by tag number or tag name div and then hit execute. Hmm. So contained within here, I guess it's H uh, proto. If I can extend just in a brief topic here, it's returning a JSON file or a JSON uh, object. Um, so everything is nested inside itself. JSON stands for JavaScript notation, uh, object notation. Um, how we would use that within our Shiny app, it could be an infinite number of possibilities. So anyway, I'll close that out. So um, basically to add the widgets. <laughs> so I don't know, what, what do you, where do you put this inside now? This, this goes inside the, the, the app, the, the UI, the server, or uh, there were three options where to put a uh, J JavaScript file, but this function, where, where should they be positioned inside the, the app, inside the UI, inside the server, outside? How do I, how would I use them? I would, if you, if you were to use any of these uh, uh, query types, Frederica, I would recommend putting them in their own standalone JS file and then making a reference to your, uh, uh, making a reference to that uh, file as a, as a function. The same thing, do you recall in our earlier chapters, I wanna say 14 and 15 maybe, we were talking about functions and modules, um, creating these, these uh, golem app uh, points that were being stored. And so you can call them an almost like an object oriented programming concept. Um, I just reference it and automatically I pass a variable that processes it in some form and then returns back out some other yeah. uh, output, returns an output. Those function calls, module calls, et cetera, are usually stored in their own um, text files, but they're referenced within the runtime of your, of your app. That's the same concept here as I would recommend putting these particular points, anything. It's, this is a really long, uh, big language. Uh, I would always want to put them in their own separate container so that I can reuse them in other, other uh, services, other apps. But, but, sorry, yes. but the functions they provide would typically be used uh, in the user interface side they would. of your, your Shiny app. Yeah, right now uh, we're just... Un unless doing... you were maybe writing tests against an app or something like that. Agreed. Typically in, in the, the working version of the app, these are things that might be, you might uh, use in the user interface to say, modify the, how it looks depending on what a user has selected or something like that. So it's code that's kind of bound to the user interface, but yes, it, it's probably better practice to put the actual JavaScript, you know, the, the, the code files in a slightly different place, but they would be called, because they're called from the user's browser, the, they would be part of the user interface code of your app, mm -hmm. I think, Federica. Good, good comment, Russ. These are very uh, analog at the moment. So uh, I was I was uh, looking on the see this this function for example document dot query selector all for example just to say this says uh, what does uh, the query selector all method returns all elements in the document that matches a specified CSS selectors as a static a static node list object. So basically, but the, this is, um, for example, linked to Mozilla, can be okay. used within Mozilla. Uh, but uh, so we use it inside the, the Shiny app to, to add things, uh, uh, features. Uh, but what I want to understand that this it looks like uh, an R function, but is not. It is not. So 
is a JavaScript function. Right. What yeah. Is it? No. Yeah. These are well, these are all JavaScript related. There's a link that. Give me one second. Um, let me select this real quick. This is in our document team. Um, it's the uh, reference to uh, Mozilla's website, and inside, uh, I guess. Mr. Colin Fay is is uh, giving us our French uh, version of of it, or it's returning the French version. Um, I have to smile about this because I don't speak French. But uh, this type is going to be all of these different various references. Um, how do I change the language? Um, this is actually a locale. Yeah, the, the, uh, top right. Uh, lang change language. No, 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 no. In the in the website. So the, the page, uh, terminology. Oh, web. there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, I didn't. I didn't catch that link. Uh, but those are those are locale changes. Uh, so there's actually two different documents. By selecting that link, I'm I'm rendering a different HTML page based on those languages. We can actually use that as a use case if you, you want to if you want to talk about what's going on from a JavaScript perspective. But either way, the web link that that was in our document. These are all different ways in which we can uh, call on these events. Um, here, yeah, DOM manipulation, uh, modifications to the document object model, hierarchy and nodes, warning, mute, mutation events are deprecated. You can't mutate anything anymore. Um, mutation observers should be used instead. Um, I didn't. I didn't open this web page prior to our presentation, so I don't want to uh, uh, take too much time here, but. I'm wanting to see if maybe there is a way that I can just get a code snippet for that JavaScript block to use it as an example. Um, in short, I guess, go back to our presentation. In short, what these various points are doing, Frederica, um, I'm just dumping them in the console directly, calling on them. We do that in our studio as well, uh, in our terminal or in our console. Uh, if I were to script that particular call, the same concepts would be there. I would have a JS file that would contain this particular um, line of text when I used it within my particular app or included it in my, my Shiny app uh, or a Golem package. It's going to, to render that, I can say, you know, pass this variable, go through this function, and then return back out some other point. The terms that we're using here are just. Uh, There's a, sorry, Ryan. Um, I, I put the link, uh, something I found. That there's an example of a shiny app, and that we able to, you might want to just copy and uh, on uh, our script and see if it works, just to have. Uh, um, I put the link on the. Chat. Uh, I don't see that link other than what Russ posted about the JavaScript for our book. Um, have you hit send already? There we go. There we go. Okay. So let's open that real quick. Okay. So here's your web link. At the very bottom, uh, okay. there's a, 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 an example uh, of a shiny app, uh, which contains no, no, a, bit, a, bit, a little bit further down. Down, okay. Yeah, uh, there you go. Okay, you want me to uh, start running this real quick? Uh, let, let me see if it's that one because I'm not sure. Uh, is that one with colors? Yeah. Uh, this uh, one is defining different the, colors. Yeah, just have a look if there's something uh, like with JavaScript or... Uh, um. Um, Maybe the, the, this part no. on the top, no? In the UI, in the server? Yeah, what, where is it? Mm. No, nothing jumps out at me that says this is, because this all looks, that all, uh, I guess tags script would be possibly within the library of Shiny that is referencing or, or would compile into a JavaScript point. Yeah. Let's try and run this okay. real quick. Let's just, for, our own learning purposes. Let's just give this a shot. Control C, dump out to our studio, file new script, drop this in, and I'm gonna have to save that. Uh, save as file, save as. 
Uh, sure, I'll just put it there. That's fine. Uh -huh. Okay. So that looks like a really busy. Uh, <laughs> that's going to give me some crazy. I don't know if I can pause that. Uh, let's do F12 developer and see if I can cover that up. I don't want anybody to get sick watching that. Um, what I'm doing, Frederica, is jumping into DevTools and then looking at the WebSocket uh, at IP address localhost port 3283. That's just a shiny web port. Um, these files that are inside here, um, let's see if I can get. Uh, it's using TypeScript. Uh, that's kind of an interesting statement there. Um, TypeScript is a, is a Microsoft specific um, library. It's a, uh, uh, it enforces type uh, classes on, on data. But, uh, so the what I'm what I'm looking at. So just remember, I apologize. I hadn't even opened this can of worms. So just pause for a moment. JavaScript is is what we use today. That's what most is recognized by the world. Um, everyone else is. You'll see a a community migration to using TypeScript instead. Um, it is a superset of the JavaScript library. So what it's doing is it's a Microsoft open source initiative that is uh, uh, evoking the uh, enforcing the type of, of calls. And I'm being very stupid when I'm making that comment because there's more to it than that. Ultimately, it is well, a- well, the, the, This is the flavor of JavaScript within which Shiny is written. That's correct. Yes, um, at least and, this example, this code snippet. Yeah, um, like the the whole of the 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 JavaScript type code, yes, uh, got converted from JavaScript to TypeScript within Shiny. I mean, obviously there'll be a lot of R and probably a few other things in there as well. But um, yeah, this is just the 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 flavor of JavaScript that Shiny's written in now. Um, not that you see that when you're developing shiny apps so much, but. Right. Um, well, it, just within this context, uh, uh, Russ or, or Frederica, um, I'm looking at the HTML document. So this one happens to be called index. Uh, you'll see index.html a lot or htm. The index is going to give us our, our uh, head value. Um, and that goes all the way to there. This is pointing at various libraries. These aren't just single files. These are literally libraries of vast amounts of these JavaScript uh, structures. And then at the bottom here, we have the actual body itself. The body is just a fluid container. There's nothing more than that. So uh, how, am I, how am I trying to, to reference this? There isn't anything as a structure here uh, in the in the body tag, it's just a fluid container. In that container would be all of our uh, associations. Let me get back to R real quick. It would be all of these. I gotta stop this. I, that's driving me. <laughs> I, I well, I'm, I know this is being recorded, and it'll it'll watch it at a later point. So it's gonna drive somebody nuts watching this video. Um, but if you look at what we're doing here, we're creating a variable called colors or an object called colors. Uh, we're using the, the rainbow function, I guess, uh, passing 40 and then alpha being null. Um, let's see, mirror the rainbow so we can cycle back and forth smoothly um, by combining uh, uh, colors with the, um, I guess, numeric values it's associating with those. Um, we're creating this tag script, shiny add custom message handler, background color function color, document body style, background colors color. And then inner text is so that, let me say it this way, the cascading style sheet is iterating through, processing through the various hex values of color attribute. Uh, and then we're creating the um, actual text reference. As you noticed, it was passing through, uh, iterating through. You had that text at the, at the top. Um, that's where your inner text color using this as a server language side, we're expecting some objects 
back to our Shiny app. Um, so here we we have a send custom message uh, session layer, and I bet that matches something that we have in our UI, doesn't it? TypeScript custom message handler. Um, Russ, this is where I, I may need a little assistance in the associations between server and, and uh, let's see if I can back out just a bit, make that easier to view. We're creating a expectation or a input reference from the browser to the server. The server passes back uh, what calculations it's made, right? So the, the actual session layer is sending custom message using the background color and then whatever the next color would be. Am I saying that correctly, sir? Um, 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 what's that in here? Background color will, so it will update. Is there a, yes, so that every, so 10 times a second, that call session dollar send custom message is r ran um, and okay. each time it runs it calls next color which just iterates over the um, the available colors background color um, so you're sending a message from R to a, 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 across the wires to the browser um, and on sending that message you are updating um, how does it work so you you're sending a, a a kind of hex code for a color or something to the browser and then when it receives that this function of color document dot body style dot background colors set so um the the dom the 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 document for your app the model of the the, the app is updated such that the colors updated each you know 10 times a second so Refreshing this is communication right. from r to javascript rather than from javascript to r which was kind of what we were talking about at much Good earlier point. Um, is there in 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 looking at the text other than this invalidate later is there any way that i can slow that process down um yeah i mean um to do, well uh, is there a reason why not to modify invalidate later well i can try it real quick um so here's uh so i'll change that to a, a thousand or something and it would be once a second let's change let's show how that works there, there's a there's one more example in the um, okay. at the bottom of the the chapter i would think we we reached the 14 minutes uh, uh past yeah <laughs> oh are we i'm so sorry team. yeah oh forgive me forgive me forgive me um, oh, that's all interesting. Very interesting. So that's why I say that. That's one one more example at the bottom of the the chapter. Uh, it's a shiny app that opens up um, like a little uh, uh, widget on the uh, Iris dataset. It makes a, a sh an app with the Iris dataset, and when you click on one of the facet, opens up. Uh, I think I think we can discuss this about uh, maybe next next week mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that would be appropriate, uh, Russ. If that would be okay with you, oh, I would yeah, be yeah, very much course, jumping yeah, yeah. at that offer. Yeah, um, I do have that example, Frederica. Uh, let me. I'll push this to our our repo, uh, Russ or or uh, John. Uh, can accept the uh, input, sure. and then we can update, and you'll you'll have access to the to the same script I've got here. Um, no, I, I, I'll take a closer look at that uh, attribute. I do have that example, Frederica, that you're having with the iris data set and the uh, facet. Uh, as soon as you select the facet, it'll automatically jump up with an alert message. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your time, team. I'm sorry that I'm 15 minutes over. That's not, that's not cool on my part. Uh, um...
sorry all right cool yeah uh so we'll uh hopefully kind of finish the chapter again uh when we when we meet next um okay cool thanks ryan for um everything uh you bet god my monitor's is turning off now um okay all right cool um i will see you all soon thank you everyone talk to you soon good to Bye. see you all